Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Daniel Banier. I'm the director for OSHA Lifelong Learning. I am excited to, that we are offering you a free seminar today on old world versus new world wine and what's the difference. Um, before we get started on the seminar and my introduction of our instructor, I just want to do quick reminders. Um, our summer taste that starts on June 12th, the registration is open, so you can still continue to register for classes. Um, so please make sure that you register for summer taste if you have not. And then this is in preclude to our wine event that is happening on campus here at Channel Islands on June 8th from 2 to 4 p.m. Um, we have a great event uh, speakers. Our President Yao will be speaking at the event, um, and we will be providing wine glasses to take home and a nice social event for you to uh, enjoy conversation, socialize, and have a glass of wine or coffee or tea, your preference, and we'll have light hors d'oeuvres for you to enjoy. Registration for that event will close today um, at 4 p.m., so if you are interested after this uh, presentation, please register before 4 p.m. Uh, so we can get our catering order in uh, with our final head count today. Uh, with that being said, we hope to see you on campus. Uh, parking is free. There'll be, uh, uh, we'll be sending out an announcement on how to find the best parking lot where we have it blocked off for this event. Um, near And the event is at the, behind the Broom Library at Linda Dulham Courtyard. So let's start introducing our instructor today. Instructor Patty Rinder is an adjunct professor in the Geosciences Department at Ventura College. She provides instruction in human geography and physical geography. She earned her master's degree in geography from Cal State Northridge and subsequently started teaching at Ventura College and CSUN uh, she taught physical geography, human geography, and world religion, regional geography, not religion, regional geography. <laughs> Sorry about that. Patty has also achieved level two of the WSET, which is Wine Spirits Education Trust, and earned a certificate of specialty in wine studies at College of the Canyons in 2015. With that being said, I don't want to take any more away from the a great seminar that we have here for you today. I hope you enjoy. With that being said, take it away, Patty. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, when I was asked to do this seminar and I had an hour, it was really kind of tricky as to, well, how do I talk about wine in an hour? So I decided, well, I'll kind of talk about what the difference is between old world wines and new world wines. So um, let's get started. So, um, Old world relates to, uh, well, I've listed only five countries there, but pretty much Europe. Wine has been made in uh, Europe for 6,000 years, so they kind of have a tradition of doing it. Um, so what we're going to do, or what I'm going to do, is talk about the differences between um, the old world and new world, and there's a lot of them. So I'm gonna focus on the five countries listed on the, the right-hand side there. And then we're gonna go over to North America, South America, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. So we're gonna head east and then south, and then, uh, sorry, we're gonna go west, south, and then east. So on this diagram here, what it's showing you, these rectangles right here, just FYI, Wine grapes are called Venice vinifera. They're grown, generally speaking, between 30 degrees north and 50 degrees north, and the same in the Southern Hemisphere. So within that band of latitude. Now with global warming occurring and temperatures getting warmer, they're actually, the, they're growing grapes in Canada. Canada, there that boundary there is the 49th parallel. So, um, there's some shifting going on there. And actually different kinds of grapes are being planted because of the warmer temperatures. All right, so just FYI, uh, percentages of old world versus new world that is um, produced, 70% come from the old world um, and the rest, and actually it says 4% in Africa. There are actually eight different countries on the African 
continent that make wine, but I'm just gonna focus on South Africa. Uh, the Americas, North and South, Asia, I'm not gonna even go there. Uh, I haven't even tasted any wine from Asia. I'm kind of curious about that. So just, that's just an, uh, an estimate what, what you can expect to find. So this is, this is the big deal. The, the top line there, differences in style, what their focus is, techniques, motivation and philosophy. So uh, as I mentioned, I think it's Armenia where they found, archeologists have found the residue of wine in some Afra that dated back to 6,000 years. So um, all the noble grapes originated in Europe. Um, and you've heard of this word called terroir. And terroir is extremely important to uh, wine growers in Europe. And that relates to um, everything, basically the weather, uh, the, if, if there's a hillside, how steep is that hillside? What direction is it facing? Definitely the soils, it's all about the soils. Um, so, and that's, and, and more things too, pruning methods also has to do with pruning relates to how much sun do you want to get down into the plant. Fertilizers, I don't know too many wineries or vineyards that actually still use fertilizers, but that's if their soil isn't robust enough to handle the, the grapevines. How the wine is made, that's all of that relates to the traditions basically of uh, the old world. Uh, they're called wine growers in Europe and we're called winemakers here in uh, the new world. And, and again, in the old world, it's all about not just terroir, but tra the traditions and keeping history alive. What that means though, is really strict laws. They're really, the wine growers are very narrowly focused on what the rules are, right? There are approved varietals for certain regions. Um, there are certain ways you can prune. Uh, how, you know, how can you blend or the, the process of blending and, all, um, and labeling too. Now the, the big deal here, old world wines have a tendency to have more tannins and tannins are from the skin and the seeds and sometimes the, um, the wood part of the, the grape itself. So red wines are, have more tannin. That's kind of like the astringent quality uh, when you first take a sip. Um, not so much over here, certainly in the North America anyway, because the wines seem to be made more fruit forward. Whereas here, you know, we, we're fruit forward because we just want to drink all wine all by itself. Over there, their wine is made to be paired with the local food. That's a big, big difference. So the new world, we don't have this, this tradition of matching the wine to the food. It's just, we just want to drink wine. No, I don't care about food. Give me some cheese and crackers, that's fine. Uh, a distinctive lo local cuisine. I'm kind of, you know, I almost took that out because there are, you know, in certain areas, a local cuisine that the wine we try to match up to. We don't have the strict laws, really strict laws uh, that Europe does. Uh, certainly about labeling and I'll get to that. But the hallmark of the new world means experimenting. We want to check things out. We want to try new blends and new styles. And, and we don't care, like I said, we don't care if we drink wine with food or not. It's just, we wanna drink wine, okay? So what I'm gonna do is uh, on the right-hand side there, I'm gonna go to five different countries in the old world and talk about uh, the particulars, certainly about the laws and uh, particular varietals. I'm not gonna go through all of the different wine regions of those five countries or even in the new world either because we don't have enough time for that. So we're gonna start with France, then go to Italy, Germany, Spain, and Portugal, and then we'll go to the new world. Okay, so we have quite a few. I'm just kind of gonna circle 
all the different regions in France, the Loire Valley, Champagne, Burgundy, Beaujolais, Bordeaux, Rhone Valley, Provence, and Languedoc, which is down here. There we go, all of them. So, um, yes. So fun fact, uh, it, and, and again, this is where terroir is extremely important. It, it's all about the where, you know, where it's grown and how it's harvested and all of that. So uh, like I said, I'm not gonna go to all of those different regions. I'm gonna, in this, I just wanna list the particular kind of varietals. Now, the thing about old world, when you buy a bottle of old world, um, lots of times, certainly in France, you may not see what the name of the varietal is. Okay, so what I've listed here is some of the major varietal, varietals that are found in these different regions. Um, Champagne, those are the three varietals that are made <clears throat> into Champagne. And um, as you probably know, no other place in the world is allowed to call their sparkling wine a champagne. However, California is an exception because uh, I think it's Andre Champagne. They were kind of grandfathered in, but as you know, no other places can call their sparkling wine champagne because it's not from champagne. Right. But again, those are the three varietals that make up champagne and uh, and, and like I said, they won't indicate on the label what the varietal is. And I'm really curious, I wanna know. Okay, so a burgundy, you might buy a red burgundy or a white burgundy. And you gotta remember, okay, a red burgundy is Pinot Noir, a white burgundy is Chardonnay. A Bordeaux on the other hand, well, it's, it's not gonna be one single varietal. It's gonna be a combination, they call them a combination, or a blend of the five that I, I listed there. The Rhone uh, styles, uh, which you're actually going to taste on Thursday, there's a Cote de Rhone Reserve that you're gonna be um, tasting, I hope. So the Rhones are, I kind of remember GSM because you see a lot of GSM blends here. That's what we call them over here. Grenache, Syrah, Mavedra, different percentages. In the Languedoc region, slash Provence is the Rhone style, which is similar to these. Everyone, and you might get a, a Viognier um, single varietal here, but not so much over there. Mousse, Marsan and Roussan are used as blending grapes as well. So let's check out the rules here. And there are a lot of them. Now in France, what, what they've done is they split up all these different regions and they base their location and categorize them into these different regions. So if it's a Vin de France, and it has to say that on the label, that's just basic table wine. Now this is a kind of wine that maybe every family who owns a vineyard makes their own wine. It's not made for selling, or at least it's made, you know, if it's, they're gonna sell it, it's just in the local liquor store down the road, if they even call them that. So the IGP, now we start getting into it's being judged. Their wine, once it's made in the proper percentages per se, is there's, there's a tasting panel. The wine has to go to a tasting panel and it has to, that an IGP wine conform to the area of production. You can't be, you know, buying grapes from another vineyard or another region per se, or another IGP. Um, okay, uh, it has to be a recommended, not necessarily required by law, grape varietal for that area. Because over time they realized, okay, in uh, the Burgundy region, Pinot Noir and um, Chardonnay do really well in that particular area. So uh, on the label, IGP will be followed by its geographic location where the wines were grown. AOP is the highest level quality that you'll find. So um, very specific requirements, 100% of the grapes have to be approved. You can't just grow what you want. Those grapes have to be approved for that particular location. And even still minimum levels of sugar before harvest, 
So that's what's called the BRICS level, B-R-I-X. They have to check that. So there has to be a minimum because that minimum BRICS level is going to determine how much um, alcohol is going to be in that wine. Okay. Um, wine practices must conform to the INO, I-N-A-O. I'm not going to even try to pronounce that. And it has to pass a taste test by a panel. Sometimes you'll see these designations on the bottle and that's the highest, highest level. So that's the groupings. Now, what about the wine labels themselves? I am always looking at wine labels. I'm just really curious. So this is just for the AOP wines. Must be from the, from the grapes grown in the area. Uh, approved for those varietals have to be approved for that area. Minimum alcohol levels, that's going to be based on the bricks level when the, the grape is harvested. Uh, there's a maximum yield that has to be achieved. And all of these things, the pruning methods, in other words, how do you trim the, the grapevines through the growing season? There's a particular way of doing it. How are you going to train that vine? And that relates to, again, the amount of sunlight that particular location gets. If it's on a hill or if the hill is like this, are the, are the rows going up the hill like this? Or are they vertical or heading down to the river? Uh, the techniques in which the wine is made. And in, 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 for the Champagne region, they always use what's called method champenois. And, and, and sometimes you'll see that label here on uh, New World wines, but Champagne has to be that particular method. All right, let's move on to Italy. So I'm just, Focusing on three, Veneto, Piedmonte, and Tuscany. Because as you can see, there's a lot of different wine regions in uh, Italy, including Sicily and Sardinia. Now, what's interesting, more than half of Italy's export wines are shipped in bulk to other countries for blending. All right, so they'll, they'll sell the, the grapes to whomever wants to use them as a blend of their own grapes. All right, so let's look at what kind of varietals we're going to find in Veneto. That's this area over here, Gaganega, Trebbiano, Pinot, Bianco, Chardonnay, and Prosecco. Prosecco is Italy's sparkling wine, as you probably know. Uh, Pimante. Nebbiolo, Barolo, Barbaresco, Barbera, and Dolcetto. And a lot of times um, these are blended. You know, you have to check the label to see what the, the percentages are. Tuscany is all about Sangiovese, right? Chianti. Super Tuscan is a Sangiovese with uh, Bordeaux varietals blended into it, like a, a Sangiovese with Cabernet Sauvignon. So that's this region right here. So they've got lots of rules as well. Uh, similar to France, as far as their um, designations as to quality, okay? So a VDT is again, a table wine, not necessarily made for selling, uh, but they export a lot of it. Some wines are distilled for industrial alcohol, believe it or not. That's Now these vines, these varietals are not high quality, obviously. Um, they're just used for local use. Uh, in 1963, DOC, made from the approved grapes varietals have to be approved for a particular terroir right approved vineyards located in demarcated geographical zones okay so the wine label needs to indicate that they have aging minimums for their particular uh, varietals a docg controller de garantita now they're they're more judged. There's a judge. There's a panel 
that does the, the quadruple S, the, the C, SIP, smell, and uh, SIP to uh, indicate or try to determine the quality. Um, and and who, who does that? Who does the tasting? Who's on that panel? And these are folks that are probably men that have been uh, in the business for a really long time. They've been recognized for their uh, knowledge and experience. And these wines too, in a DOCG is like a Chianti or a, a, a Super Tuscan. Now it has to be something that is recognizable to the general public. Okay, the, the last one here, um, it depends on who you talk to. It's either IGT or IGP. This is Indication Geographica Typica or Indication Geographica, whoopsie, uh, Proteta. So these are approved, only approved grapes go into these wines. Um, now what's interesting, the wine labels cannot indicate any specifics, which I find really interesting, right? Because when I like, when I look at a label, I wanna know where it's grown. Just, I'm just because I'm curious, all right? So those are the different levels of quality um, in Italy. And I like this little um, pyramid here that gives you a sense, okay, Bio Tabla, uh, Tavola is the table wine, DO, DOC, DOCG, and then the um, IGT. Okay, so on their labels, Place names. Now it's like Chianti, Chianti Classico. Well, that's, you have to remember where it is, right? Just like France, it'll tell you this is a Bordeaux and then you have to think, okay, what does the Bordeaux mean? In Chianti Classico, it's gonna be Sanchiovese. The proprietary name, Serena. Now that sort of thing happens a lot. Um, a, a proprietary name or fantasy name, will be given to, mostly, mostly over here as well, is a, a blend of some sort. So they'll give it a, 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 another name. They won't say the blend is, you know, cab and cab franc sort of thing. Sometimes you'll see the varietal in a place name, like Bernaccia di San Jimmy Lagno, whatever that is. I'm probably spelling or pronouncing it incorrectly. So this is what you need to look for. And what they're not, what I didn't list here is also um, alcohol level. I kind of want to know what the alcohol level is on, on a wine that I'm drinking. Let's move over to Germany. Um, so I'm only, I've only chosen two, the Moselle, which is along this river and the Rheingau. Now, that, that tiny little section here, these are the most kind of popular regions in Germany. Now, again, remember what I said about latitude. So the, the higher up in latitude you go, the cooler the temperatures. That's going to determine the kind of grapes you're going to grow. Red varietals have a thicker skin, so they can tolerate hotter temperatures. So what you see here in the Moselle along the river and so is, uh, and I, I found this map for this little section, this little bend in the river. And notice here the topography. I haven't been, I haven't explored, I've been to Berlin, uh, kind of drove through Germany and ended up in Berlin, but I didn't get a chance to do any wine tasting. Anytime uh, there are rivers, there's gonna be usually uh, a hillside. And the hillside is where they're gonna plant grapes. Sometimes they're really, really steep and they're so steep that they can't be harvested by any kind of machine. It has to be harvested by hand. Now, the reason why is because the, the, the sunlight reflecting off of the river provides a lot of light, right? And again, it all, it all depends on the aspect. In other words, of that hillside, the aspect means what direction is it facing? So obviously if you're in the Northern hemisphere, an aspect that's facing south. Here we're in the northern hemisphere of a hillside 
needs to be facing south to get as much sun as possible. All right, so Moselle, Riesling, and when you hear Riesling, usually you might remember it's some, it's pretty sweet. And Germany's known for that. Mueller uh, Thurgau is another one along the Moselle. Riesling again in the Rheingau right here in Spotburger, Burgunder is what they uh, call Pinot Noir. A Pinot Noir is a really thick, finicky grape. It's thin skin. There's like a thousand different clones. And a clone is a, a, a natural variety kind of genetic change over time. There's over a thousand of them. And I'm always curious what kind. Uh, so Pinot Noir is very finicky. It, it doesn't have a thick skin, even though it's a red grape. So it's you've got to find the right place to grow Pinot Noir. OK. It's all about the sweetness level, okay? I always have fun facts just to kind of give you a little bit of information. German wine laws do not take into account terroir. What they want, I don't know, for whatever reason, they really like their sweet wines. So here, and I don't speak German, so Qualtit Sat Swine, this is the different, this is sweetness levels. And this is different um, quality levels. So the varietal must be approved by the German wine authorities. That sounds kind of scary. Can be chaptalized. So chaptalization is the process of adding sugar to the must after the wine has been, uh, the uh, grapes have been harvested and they're sitting in that bin. And again, the bricks amount is an indication that's, that's the level of sugar. And usually, you know, they try and pick it at like 22 to 26 or something. So you can kind of figure half of that will end up uh, being converted into alcohol. Okay, so they like their wines sweet. So they're allowed to add sugar to increase the alcohol content. And of course, the sweetness of the wine. We don't do that here. Grapes must be grown when in the 13, whatever, whatever, the specific regions in Germany, of which there's 13 of them. Uh, Padigat's swine is different levels. Here, Cabinet, fully ripe grapes. Fatlasse, late pick, that means when the grapes are left on the vine and they start shriveling up like raisins, that really concentrates the sugar. Oslase, some bunches are selected as showing off, so they, they're very picky with the bunches that they, they harvest. Baron Oslase selected berries, so not only just a bunch, but they'll take berries off because not all berries on a bunch is going to ripen at the same uh, time, so they'll actually pick off the berries. Ice wine. So ice wine, as you may know, grapes left on the vine until they freeze. So in the Northern hemisphere, harvesting usually takes place in September, October. It all depends on the weather, right? How hot the temperatures have been. So and um, in Germany, probably the latitude would be the same as no, it's going to be a little bit higher. I would say maybe 40 degrees north. Ventura is at 34 degrees north. So for it to the grapes to stay on the vine until it freezes, you're into November, December probably. But that's what ice vine is. The frozen water is discarded, leaving the flavors of that grape really intense. Trockenberry Oslase, dried berries picked out. Grapes are covered with botrytis. Now, botrytis is a mold, which is kind of gross to be picking grapes and actually using them to harvest and, blend and, and press into a wine, but it really concentrates the flavor. But again, what's interesting about Germany, they like their wine sweet. So there you go. <laughs> I wouldn't want to harvest. Sect. All right. So we know that uh, no other countries can use the word champagne for their sparkling wine. So just as Italy has Prosecco, 
Germany has sect. Um, <laughs> in, in a lot of it doesn't go anywhere, it just stays in Germany because Germans drink 80% of it. Um, bargain sect uses grape from other countries. Now that's, you know, there's, that's kind of interesting, right? I doubt that they put that on the label either. Best of the bargain sect, well, you can get an idea if you want to look for that, made by the Charmat method. It's not the, it's not the method uh, Champagnois, it's a different kind of method. Fine uh, grapes are from the from Germany, one of the 13 regions, made in the Champagne method. And we don't know, you know, if I could focus more on the Champagne region, I can show you that whole process. When select great variety inventions must be listed on the label, produced in the traditional method, grapes from a single vintage or estate. So this is gonna be, this is the cheap stuff, this is a little bit more expensive, and this is, you know, more expensive. I don't know, let's say $8, $15 and $25. That's just my guess. I really don't know. It's just the, the, the more quality, higher quality of the grape means it's going to be selling for more money. All righty. Now we're on to Spain. Now, out of the all the, I just want to give you the fun facts here. Grapes have been cultivated in Spain for three to four thousand years. Uh, it has the most acreage of all the countries in the old world, but their wine yields are far less than France and Italy. So their yield per acre is more. That doesn't necessarily mean that's quality wine. All right. So briefly, we'll look at uh, Galicia. Castilla de y Leon, Rioja, Catalonia, over there by Brazil, uh, Barcelona, and Andalusia, which is down south there. In this, you know, it's like I skipped over this whole middle, but these are not, all of these regions here are considered more quality, high quality wines. So Galicia up here, Albareño, Castilla, Tempranillo, they call it Tintafino, right here. Garnacha, you're actually going to tease, you're going to have a, a Garnacha de Fuego uh, Thursday, so you can check it out. Uh, and Verdejo and Rioja over here, Tempranillo, um, Garnacha, Graciano, and Mazuero, Catalonia over here, Paraleta, Zarelalo, Macabeo, and Malvasia. And Andalusia down here, is Palomino Fino, so that's where they make the sherry. And I put the cava here. Cava is Spain's sparkling wine. They've got lots of rolls too. So the this, found the label over there, governs the boundaries of the wine regions, great varietals that you can grow in that region, how much you can grow and produce at harvest time, you can't be, you know, under or above a, a certain yield. Here in Spain, they have very particular methods of pruning for each of these different areas. Vinification is the process of making wine and aging methods or levels, you could say, or aging lengths of time, they have rules for that as well. Now these are the different quality levels. VDM is their version of table wine. Unclassified vineyards could be from anywhere. And, and sometimes it's been declassified by blending. And what that means is that it's not an approved varietal, but if you're just making a table wine, it's not like the, the, the INDO is, really cares about that. They have what's called IGP or PGI, when wine and, uh, originates from a specific place, has to have a certain quality level. There has to, that particular place has to have a reputation for producing really good wine. Uh, essentially, it's just, and, it, and again, it's about terroir. They don't use that word over there, but it's it's geographical location. And, and, and the one thing when, I, when you learn about um, managing a vineyard, 
it's it's all about the where, you know, the why of where. Where are you going to plant the grapes? What's below the surface as far as the soil is concerned? It's really important what kind of soil is there because certain vines can't grow in particular kind of soils. And do you have the influence of a sea breeze? Do you have fog coming in? Do you have a sun? You know, how many hours of daylight do you have? That's something that has to be considered. Uh, a, a DO, each region is governed by a Consejo Regulador. So each region has their own boss or chief, so to speak. Uh, and, and, and that person is the one that de defines the boundaries of these particular regions. They decide what varietals are going to be good and, and do well in that particular region. They decide how much you can produce as far as yield is concerned. Now, the thing about yield has to do with pruning methods. And um, if you allow all the grapes bunches to grow, it it's or or you're more particular about pruning methods, so you have fewer bunches per vine, the, the concentration of the flavors are going to be uh, better, stronger when you have fewer bunches of grapes. Uh, limits of alcohol strength, they don't want to get too heavy duty. Here in the U.S., we're getting up to 15% in wine. It's pretty crazy. And other quality standards or production limitations. So a DOC, which you've heard that term before, highest uh, category uh, as far as quality is concerned, reserved for regions with above average uh, grapes that have continued to produce high quality uh, over a long period of time. Moving on to sport, Portugal. I, I feel like I'm talking a lot. I'm talking really fast and I don't want to read everything, but there's a lot of rules over there. Um, all right, Portugal. I definitely want to go to Portugal. We're going to go to Vino Verde, the Douro. There's a river there in Madeira, which is this island down here. Um, Interesting fact here, 1756, remember in Europe, wine has been grown for thousands and thousands of years. So Portugal was actually the first country in Europe in 1756 to say, oh, you know what? This region, this area does really well with this particular wine or this varietal. And, and why, do, why do wineries do that? It's all about this, prevent wine fraud. There's a really good movie about that, all right? So they want to be uh, appreciated for the particular varietals that are grown in a particular area. Portugal itself, it's not a very big country, has th over 300 indigenous grapes you won't find anywhere else. Okay. Won't be focusing on that. So what they have is a beneficio rating system for the wines. And this is just for the Douro region. That's this right here, the Douro Valley. Remember, where there's a river, you, a lot of times you'll find vineyards. I heard an expression, grapes like to look at the light. So check this out, 37, far, 37 this is just in the Douro region. 37,000 farmers who manage 83,000 individual vineyards in that region. That's just, I mean, that I have some really good resource material and that those numbers are just like blew me away. So this, they have their own organization that is the, the boss. And so this um, institution provides this system, Beneficio system, rates vineyards on a grade level, A to F. And they are given a certain number of points. The total is 1680. And you can kind of see what points are applied. Altitude, how far, obviously, if it's on a slope. The quality of the grapes, I think that should be higher. Their production methods, the gradient, which is the slope itself, uh, upkeep and maintenance. I'm assuming that means I don't know of the, the winery itself or uh, of the pruning of the vines. 
age of the wines, I would imagine the older the vines, the, the higher the number. So the position itself must have to do with its terroir, if you want to call it that. I don't know what the Portuguese word is for that. So this beneficio rating, again, the total number of points you can get is 1680, but you get an A. Now this is like, this is really loose here for me as a teacher. Um, I would not go down to 1200 to still give a, a vineyard an A, but that's just, maybe I'm a mean teacher, I don't know. Anyway, uh, what about labeling? Uh, oh, some more here. They have their um, indications as to quality as the other countries do. This is the institution that is the federal agency grants the demarcation areas. So it's not up to a regional boss per se, it's up to the federal government. So the, the wine quality is similar to what we've seen before. Uh, Vino de Mesa is your table wine. Uh, indica, I'm not gonna even try. Now this the IPR is being phased out and they're using more Vino Regional. Older vines use the v, uh, VR on the labor, label. Uh, newer ones are using uh, the IGP that you saw, this one here. Uh, DOC, stringent controls on production, labeling, and it goes through a taste panel. Now remember that word, declassifying. So producers, growers can say, oh, you know, it's not the best quality. I'm going to declassify this. So uh, they don't have to adhere all, to all the different stringent uh, methods that they're, they have to by the government. Ah, yes, I thought there was something else about Portugal. Now, that's, this is where port is made um, in Madeira, Madeira and the lower portion. I didn't circle it on uh, the map of Portugal. But here, and I would imagine the other New World locations cannot produce a fortified wine and call it port. They are not allowed to do that because port is from Portugal, from this particular region, okay? They might call it Porto or port style, that sort of thing, but they can't call it port. Now, what's interesting about uh, Portugal is they make it, the, these are the Vino uh, Verde varietal, if I recall. So they make the port in tra a traditional method. So these, you, this, is, this is concrete bins. So you can get a sense of the size of them by these two men standing there. So the, the grapes are harvested and they're left in these big bins. They're called lagares, okay? And that's where the fun begins because what they do is like, hey, you know, looks like a school kids came over and, and this is what they do. They will smash the grapes by their feet and just have a party. <laughs> it's like, that looks kind of fun. <laughs> Surprised they're not doing the Macarena, but uh, yeah, that's just a traditional way of doing it. So why not? All right, so we did five countries of the old world. Now we're going to move over to the new world. Ooh, I need to move the speed up a little bit. Sorry. Uh, okay, we're going to start in, and again, 30 to 50. This is a little bit more loose here. There's lots of different, actually, there is wine grown. Oopsie, let me go back here. No, okay. I'm gonna focus mostly on California, obviously. And there's, you know, there's so many different regions. I, I can't go into uh, all of them or even you know, hardly any of them, but um, California is known be for producing 90% of the wine made in the US because we're so good at it. So the North Coast is Sonoma County and Napa. I haven't been up to those areas in a long time, but this gives you a sense of what kind of varietals are grown. Uh, Central Coast is all the way from Monterey, San Luis Obispo, pa Paso Robles, and then sent down to Santa Barbara. So Chardonnay, Pinot Noir. Now this should not, remember what I said about Pinot Noir and Chardonnay is a white uh, varietal. So Monterey County, it's a lot cooler up there. So they're gonna, 
grow grapes that are thin skinned and finicky. Here, Zin, Merlot, Cab, Syrah, uh, Bordeaux, and uh, Loire Valley varietals, they can be grown in hot regions like uh, Paso Robles. And again, down in Santa Barbara, it's a little bit cooler. And, and this I just found out, I just wanted to, I just threw this in this morning because this last weekend I went uh, to a two, two different, uh, well, a new winery and a, and a bar, so to speak. And orange wine seems to be a new thing. And I thought, wait a minute, are they making wine out of oranges? I'm confused. No, uh, it's kind of like a rosé, but they don't call it a rosé. Uh, these are white varietals. I think this was a Viognier. And in a white wine, the, 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 the grapes are pressed pretty quickly because you don't want the influence of the color of the skin. But in this case, the orange wine, the grapes were not pressed. They were left on their skins for, I think she said, eight days. I was not pressed. ABA. So this, and remember what about the new world? There's there's not a whole lot of rules like the old world. However, there is an organization, obviously, the um oh, sorry, Alcohol Tobacco Tax Trade Bureau. They're the ones, if you're growing uh, grapes, you're making wine, you have to send what you want your label to look like to them and they approve it. So here in the United States, we have what are called AVAs, American Viticulture Areas. And actually 35 states, is it 35 I think? 34 states are growing grapes. Um, most of them, they're, they can be huge. Like this one in, in the Mississippi River Valley, 29,900 square miles. And, and there's another one, Coal Ranch, ABA in California, only 60 acres. So factors like the strength of the location, the image, the, the reputation that particular place has, climate, geography, and history are considered. Because you can, you know, a particular group of uh, winemakers can petition to have a, a new ABA created. And they have to argue that, okay, this is a special place. The slope of the hillside faces this direction. You got the reflection from the river. You've got the particular, it's all about the soil as well, right? Um, blah, blah, blah. Um, okay, so as far as the labels are concerned, and like I said, I'm always looking for, for information on the labels. And there are uh, restrictions, certainly. So if, if there's gonna be a name of a particular varietal, I actually, you're going to be tasting a Cabernet Sauvignon at the uh, event on Thursday from California. I didn't write down what the uh, winemaker or the vineyard. However, okay, so doesn't mean it's 100% Cabernet. It it's only has to be 75 and they can blend in other varietals, but they don't have to tell you about it. Okay, uh, now similar to the champagne situation in California, most of the wineries cannot say champagne on their label except ones that are grandfathered in decades ago. You can't use, you can't say Chablis or Burgundy, right? Because those are locations, not allowed. Uh, producers not to require the list of percentages of all the wines used in a blend. But like I said, I'm really curious. So place name, um, just the ABA, not necessarily the vineyard itself. And again, it has to be an ABA that's been approved by the TTB. Um, if you put a county on there, at least 75% of those grapes have to be there. If an ABA is on there, at least 85 of the grapes must be grown in that ABA. Washington and Oregon demand that 100% of the grapes grown in that place is indicated on the label. The vintage, so the vintage is the year in which the grapes were harvested. At least, nine, this is kind of interesting, at least 95% of the grapes must have been harvested in that year. Sometimes you'll see an NA or NV, which is no vintages, non-vintage, which is normally used for like four to five wines. So if you don't know the history about the, the wine in California, it's quite interesting 
there's this book here, um, and this one here, uh, Tangled Vines, that talks about it. And uh, it's all about this dude here, uh, brought uh, great vines over from uh, Spain. And, and if you ever get a chance to go down to Mission San Juan Capistrano, which I did a couple of years ago, there are still uh, evidence of the original winery that's created there. And of course, we need the wine for our Catholic um, going to church on Sunday, I should say. Um, okay. I could go on and on about California, but there's we don't have enough time. So Chile is considered the Bordeaux, we're going south now, of, uh, into South America, the Bordeaux of South America. What does that mean, right? Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Malbec, uh, Cab Franc. Okay, so Central Valley, there, the big one. And then uh, over in Argentina, I'm just gonna focus on Mendoza because I wanna go there. Uh, so the Central Valley has multiple different uh, regions that grow grapes. Uh, do know that the Andes Mountains split the two countries, right? So the Andes Mountains really has a big impact on uh, climate on, on either side, right? And, and also know that along Chile's border, we have a cold ocean current. You can't be, really can't really grow grapes along a, um, a warm ocean current because it, it, it puts too much moisture in the atmosphere. So what I found really interesting, the must and the concentrate of Argentinian wines are exported for blending, mostly to the UK, Japan, and Venezuela. Okay, UK doesn't grow much, neither does Japan, it's too far north, and Venezuela is close, too close to the equator, it's too hot. So the must is, is when the grapes are, are pressed, that's what's left over, the skins, the seeds, uh, the twigs and stuff. Uh, oldest wine region um, in the Central Valley here, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Carmineri. Now this varietal here used to be in uh, grown in France and it was one of the noble grapes, but they, they don't use it. And I think they're taking those plants out. The Maple Valley is Chile's most famous region. The white grapes that are grown in the Central Valley, Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc. Okay. Uh, now what's interesting, early morning cold air. Remember what I said about, so you can see there's not a whole lot right on the coast itself, but this is a cold ocean current. So it's gonna create fog like we get here, right? And what they do is they use windmills to kind of circulate the, the, the air and try and warm it up because it's just a little bit too cold. The Mall Valley, do I have circles here? There we go. There's Maypo and the Mall Valley, that little one way up there. There's Mall. Um, Cabernet Sauvignon and Pays. I'm not sure that I'm pronouncing that right, but that's particular to um, Chile. And that's, that's a varietal that's used just locally. It's kind of like table wine. So labeling, if there's a varietal on there, we don't have anything from Chile. We have France and Spain on Thursday. Uh, so the varietal, if it's on the label, that is such as this, it has to be 75%. And even if the region, if it's Mall Valley, it only has to be 75%. Vintage, again, it's the year that grapes were harvested. Um, they do have what are kind of loosely considered to be um, quality levels. Uh, and they also will give you a sense of how long that wine was aged. Usually in red grapes, it's it's a barrel, an oak barrel. Uh, a state must be grown uh, on that particular vineyard. There's particular levels for alcohol to be exported, white wines anyway. It's interesting, I, I see that the, the red wines that are ex to be exported is a lesser alcohol content. And, and even in Chile, there's some uh, government recognized vines. 
doesn't mean that's the only thing that they can produce. Argentina, again, Mendoza. I want to go there. Uh, just FYI, uh, wineries are called Bodega there. Um, and it's known for its uh, Malbec, which I love. Oh, San Juan, there's the other ones too. But I'm going to focus mostly on uh, Mendoza. So Malbec and Torrentes. Okay, now this is the leeward side of the Andes Mountains. On the leeward side of a mountain range, it's a lot warmer than on the windward side. So they can grow certain varietals that are thick-skinned. Uh, thick um, these varietals, Sangiovese, Tempranillo, usually are planted by uh, Spanish and Italian immigrants, usually made into jug wine slash table wines. They have an institute that uh, watches over here even more, certainly more stringent than uh, in the United States, pruning methods, even when you can harvest, uh, how to transport the grapes, when to release a particular uh, vintage. Their, their levels of quality is IG and DOC, which is familiar. And again, it's similar to what we call ABAs in the United States. So they have to petition to that particular institute to get a new one designated. All right, South Africa, we're gone across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, wineries are considered to be wine farms. And basically there's all these different areas, but this is where I wanna focus. And that little star is Cape Town. What they have there are called uh, geographic units, where in, uh, in the States, it's, they're called ABAs. These are called GUs. So South Africa, I had some Chenin Blanc the other day, uh, which was really lovely. That's what uh, South Africa is actually known for. They do have their Shiraz is uh, Syrah. And Pinotage, is a is a blend between Pinot Noir and Sin Salt. So, just like Father Sarah brought some cuttings over from Spain, uh, the Dutch colonized well pretty much every country in Africa except two have been colonized by some European nation, uh, and it was the Dutch via East India Company that colonized uh, South Africa. Now, um, they in South Africa, they have this, a Cooperative Wine Growers Association of South Africa, and this is their designation. And what this is, it's a cooperative, which means in uh, where the vineyards and the winemakers are not individually selling their own stuff. It's a cooperative. And I think when they group together like that, their their power is a little bit more um, concentrated. Uh, still about 25% of the wine produced is under their control rather than a cooperative is now a collection of private companies. I didn't really mention that in California, but there's a lot of wineries that are owned by other companies. And I think it's mostly for... Um, economics. So they have their own, and again, what I mentioned be before was they're called geographical units. Um, and then it's, and those are pretty broad. This is a mega appellation, right? They're really, really big. And so they, they get them smaller and smaller into regions, districts, wards, and then an estate would be basically one. It could be several vine vineyards, but um, it's farmed as one unit. They're a little bit looser as far as, or actually I should say a little bit more stricter as far as labeling is concerned. So if you're growing a Pinotage, it better be 95% of the grapes must be in that, that wine. Oh, the vintage, that's a, the grape variety is 85%, not 75 as it is here. The place name, 100% of the grapes must be grown in that particular place. However, if, it's an, if it just has a geographical unit, it could be all over the place. All right. 
getting there. I'm almost done. Um, so what's what's unique about um, Australia? I did do some traveling around there and did, uh, of course, you had to do some wine tasting. Um, so we'll talk about Barros, uh, Barossa Valley, Adelaide Hills. I'm sorry. Okay, I didn't have my other circles there. Adelaide Hills is pretty much all in this particular area. McLaren Valley, I'm gonna take you there in Coonawarra. Um, notice up here, fun fact, grapes, grape vines were um, first planted after the first fleet arrived in Botany Bay in Sydney in 1788 from grapes brought from, uh, excuse me, that should be from um, England. Um, not from South Africa. Uh, so Botany Bay, well, that's another story. I don't really have time to tell you about the penal colonies and all that sort of stuff, but we'll, we'll get to that. So these are the different, Shiraz is Syrah. Uh, McLaren Valley is in here. Shiraz and Cab. Kunawara, Bordeaux, all those Bordeaux varietals. South Australia, this region here produces more than half. That's why I'm actually focusing on it. Um, Kunawara is a um, Aboriginal name, meaning wild honeysuckle. And I, I have this picture, a not so fun fact. Yeah, you can actually see kangaroos kind of hanging out in the vineyard, but the viticulturists don't really like that because they like the grapes. So this part, South um, Australia region, uh, which is one of the states, it provides most of the wine. Okay. Pinawara is down there. That's where it is. Okay, so they do have, this is uh, uh, an agency, notice a uh, uh, kangaroo and a alpaca, I think it is. Their labeling laws are similar. However, they do, if they blend a wine, it has to say the percentages. What's unique about Australia, Australia doesn't really like to follow their, they have their own, their own rules, but uh, the bin numbers, if you see that, gives you a sense of how much it's going to cost, actually. Pinfolds cap, Cabernet Sauvignon, bin 407. Uh, moderately priced, bin 707. Uh, smaller lots, they're more expensive. Uh, they have what are called GIs, geographic indications, as far as their different uh, regions are concerned. So what's different about Australia is they, they want to check things out. They want to try new things. Uh, and you can go to, they're called cellar doors, the wine tasting rooms. So what I found really interesting, wines labeled Southeastern Australia, which is not the state of South Australia, it's southeastern Australia, comes from the island of uh, Tasmania, Victoria, uh, New South Wales, and Queensland. So it's, and I'll show you a, a type of wine that is produced and sold. Uh, now here in Australia, four large influential companies that are um, responsible for more than 50% of the wines this is, you won't find this. This is another unique thing about Australia. This, this the, the Yellow Wine Tail Company has 100 of these stainless steel uh, tanks and each of these tanks is 264,000 gallons, pretty wild. The other interesting thing about Australia is these fermentation tanks, which are kind of funky looking, they're sitting on their sides and what they do is they actually rotate. Right. And the picture in the middle, I wanted to add that because it's a stock photo, but this is uh, there's there's not enough harvesters in uh, uh, Australia, you know, manual labor to uh, harvest the grapes by hand. So they have to use machines, kind of shake the bush and go into a bucket. Um, Shiraz and Riesling, 74 cellar doors, uh, 106 vineyards. I wanted, this is where I went. If you go to Australia, you need to go to McLaren Val and head to the cube. Uh, it's pretty freaky. And this guy, Chester Osborne, he um, created this building and it kind of looks like these different layers, these floors might kind of move, but they don't. It's kind of weird on the inside though. 
uh, when you first go into the bottom floor, it's a 360 degree theater with some really kind of freaky movies going on there that don't really make sense. They have what's called a um, wine sensory room. So go into this room, it's got all this kind of fruit, fake fruit hanging on the wall and you push, it's like a horn that you push the thing and you smell it and they have a particular kind of smell of a lemon or a peach or that sort of thing. It's pretty wild, pretty wild. I wanted to show you this. Where else are you gonna find this? Look at the label. Yeah. I mean, there's there's mermaids swimming underneath the counter. It's They're not real ones, but it's just really kind of crazy. So I wanna to talk to you about 19 crimes very briefly. We're still in Australia. What I learned about 19 crimes, I really like their wines. They're inexpensive. Um, and, and then I found out, I thought, I, I don't know where they grow their grapes because I gotta know. And it's one of those examples of Southeastern Australia. So they get the grapes from hundreds of miles away. So 19 crimes, why is it called that? It goes back to the fact that those grapes were, came from um, Europe, from England, because a lot of um, this was this, a lot of Australia was colonized by convicts. Okay, and there's a list of 19 crimes that if you committed one of them, you would be, your punishment would be transportation. What does that mean? It means transportation. You're on a ship heading to Van Diemen's land. Van Diemen's land is Tasmania. Um, and there's actually some penal colonies on, on the mainland of Australia. So 19 crimes. Um, and I, when I go travel somewhere, I want to read some books about it. So there's two books, Hell's Gate and then Banished Beyond the Seas talks about that, about how these prisoners that stole a piece of sausage or did some silly thing. There's a list of the 19 crimes. You can find them on this website. But the other cool thing about this, I'll show you this just a couple of minutes. We have no sound. All right. I mean, this is, you know, it's another minute and a half or something, so I don't want to take too much of your time. But the point I'm trying to make here is that Australia is so unique and uh, These you can, I have the app on my phone, it's called Living Labels. And so you can go to the grocery store, to the wine shop or whatever, go to the 19 Crimes label uh, and, and click on your Living Labels um, app and it'll tell you the story of that particular convict. Like he just, this is Mike Harrington and he did something really not a whole very criminal, but it was enough to be sent away to Australia. And there's another one here too. That website, 19crimes.com, slash the 19 crimes list them what the crimes were all right okay sorry we're almost done last country new zealand one of my favorite places on the planet and as you can see there's lots of different uh regions um a fun fact the maori name for new zealand is aotearoa which is uh means land of the long white cloud so we're going to look at hawks bay in the North Island, Marlborough at the north end of the South Island, and then we have to go to Otago, Central Otago. All right, um, a similar situation, uh, New Zealand was colonized while well, it's part of the Commonwealth with um, England and Australia and a couple of other countries. But this gives you a sense of the history of it. And um, 
What's interesting about New Zealand is they had a temperance movement as well. They were like, okay, the, the, the wives and the moms are saying enough of this, the dude's going to the bar after work and getting drunk. They, they actually did have a prohibition for a certain length of time. What, now check this out, wineries couldn't sell to, con to consumers, which is, I, I don't get it. Um, wines were watered down in the 20s and the 60s, and that was legal. I'm not quite sure why, maybe after the prohibition, it was like, oh, we don't wanna make our wines too alcoholic, so we'll add more water to decrease that. Uh, it wasn't until the 1960s that you could buy wine in a restaurant. And here, even now, you can't buy wine uh, or alcohol after 10 o'clock. All right, now, um, no strict system for laws uh, as it relates to practices. There are labeling laws, and I gave you an example here. Cloudy Bay is very popular over here. Um, if two varietals are listed on, it says listed in order of importance, and my, my takeaway from that is the higher percentage varietal would be listed first. Uh, and again, if the area here, this would be um, just as product of New Zealand. So it doesn't say its particular area. Okay, uh, North Island Hawks Bay, known for its Merlot Cab uh, Cabernet blends. Fun fact, because of its location on the planet of uh, New Zealand's vineyards get to see the sun first out of all the countries in the world because it's close to international dateline. Now, uh, I've been around, I married a Kiwi a long time ago, and so I've been to New Zealand quite a few times and did some uh, road tests or road, road trips there. Um, I want to point out one little town here on this map. These are all the different um, cellar doors. Napier is somewhere in here. Napier, there it is right there. A really cool little town. You might want to check it out. What's interesting about it, New Zealand is right on the, a, a border. It's a convergent plate border, so they will get really big earthquakes. And they did. Um, 1931, 7.8, shook for two and a half minutes. Another one, six point, you guys can relate to earthquakes, right? 6.4, five days later, 7.3, 10 days later, that. 597 aftershocks. So the town was destroyed. The reason why you need to go to uh, Napier, remember this 1931, totally redesigned into the Art Deco architecture, which I really like. Uh, whoopsie, there we go. So that's the unique thing about Napier in Hawke's Bay. South Island, you probably have heard about Marlboro, famous for its Sauvignon Blanc. It also grows Chardonnay and Riesling. Um, and then Cloudy Bay, this is where Cloudy Bay is from. Uh, a fun fact, I called my husband a Kiwi because that's, you call them Kiwis if they're from New Zealand. Um, Central Otago, so when I worked at Labyrinth Winery when they were downtown, the winemaker, uh, Rick Hill, uh, is from New Zealand. And when I went to the South Island, I said, Rick, where do I go? You have to go to Central Otago because they're known for their uh, Pinot Noir. Uh, fun fact, between 94 and 98, the industry grew so much in New Zealand that their number of winemakers went from 31 and 94 to 293. So yeah, Central Otago is down here. The other unique thing about New Zealand, see the, the latitude here, 45 degrees south. Not only is New Zealand the first country with vineyards to see the sun every day, uh, but it's the most southerly region in the world. It's more south than, than South Africa. And it's still, in a Pinot Noir, it's, it's not a thick skin grape, it's pretty finicky. So it's not gonna handle really cold, hot temperatures. All right. Wow, I feel like I went through that pretty quickly. So I hope I didn't go too quick. Um, and again, for Thursday, from what I understand, you're going to get a Cote de Rhone from France, a Garnacha from Spain, and a Movedra from Spain. And then they'll have a Cab from California, a Sav Blanc from California, uh, that's in Paso, a Chardonnay from the Sonoma Coast. Not sure what else they'll have, but what I would really love to do is be able to kind of 
give you a cab or excuse me, a Bordeaux from France and a cab from California. So you can kind of taste this, test the difference uh, between the two. Um, and the other thing too, I just want to throw it out here. I don't know if you'll take me up on it or not, but uh, it, when I had my meetup group, I had what was called a badass Bordeaux blending contest because in Bordeaux, they blend their varietals, right? So, uh, and I, I had a contest, I had all the different varietals and each team created their own blend. Then we all kind of, you know, didn't tell anybody, you know, what our blends were and we tasted them and had a little contest. It was kind of fun. But if you're interested in doing that, let me know. All right, sorry. Anybody have any questions? How can we get your, um, all the, information that you provided because I was taking notes, but <laughs> I couldn't write that fast. I know, and I felt like I was talking really fast. I mean, I'd be happy to send uh, Michael or, or Daniel my PowerPoint if you're interested. That would be terrific, would be thank you. Okay. Yeah, I asked the same thing, can we get a PDF? Oh, sure. Answer? That would be great, thank you. Yeah. yeah, there was a lot there, that's for sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Thanks very much, Patty and Daniel. And Thank Mike. you, Donna. We'll see you Thursday. You bet. Bye. Bye. So on behalf of Ollie, we'd like to thank you all for joining us for this seminar. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, we invite you to take a look into our programming with the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. Um, I will go ahead and post a link in the chat. Uh, a reminder will be going out in about 15 minutes for Thursday's wine event, and that will include all of the details, including where to park and the map locations on campus. And uh, if you weren't able to attend this entire seminar, or if you'd like to share it with your family or friends, we will be posting a recording of this within the next few days on our website for your uh, later viewing. And we also would, once again, would like to thank Patty Ridenauer for spending her time with us today to learn more about wine. Thank you, Patty. We appreciate you. You're sure welcome. Glad to be here. Thank you, everybody. Bye.